All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, today's Sierra Nevada Alliance monthly webinars topic is what can environmental organizations do to increase diversity? And we are having a panel discussion today. Um, and so this, um, I'm Sarah Monson. I'm the Education and Communication Director at Sierra Nevada Alliance. And this webinar series is part of our Sierra Nevada Alliance member group program. Um, our member group program provides resources for Sierra Nevada conservation organizations. A few of these resources include our SNAP um, member program. Every year we place 28 um, Sierra Nevada AmeriCorps partnership members at organizations throughout the Sierra conservation organizations working on watershed projects. We're currently recruiting organizations that would like to host SNAP members. So if your organization or any organizations you know in the Sierra might be interested in that, um, please reach out to me and I will um, get you connected with Rachel Durbin, our um, SNAP program director. We also have this webinar series next month for the exact date, but I'll be sending out thing, um, information shortly. So stay tuned or check our website. We'll be doing a webinar on board engagement and responsibility. We also do workshops. We had a grant writing workshop in Auburn a few months ago, and we will be having another one in the Eastern Sierra. And we also act as a collective voice for the Sierra, so we engage in lobbying for different um, initiatives that support Sierra environmental work. And um, if you're interested in becoming a member group, please reach out to me. I will be emailing everybody who's at this, so you don't need to remember my email, but it is sara.monson, mon.son at Sierra, mon.son at Sierra Nevada Alliance org. So the structure for today is we are going to start with speaker introductions. We have four formulated questions and then we'll move on to any questions that our attendees have. So the description of today's webinar is environmental organizations struggle to engage diverse audiences. It's time for our community to take active steps to engage a demographic that is representative of communities that we work in. Join us for a discussion about the barriers to reaching this goal and the concrete steps that environmental organizations can take to bring diversity to their board, staff, communities, and organizations that they engage. So today's speaker, we will hopefully, I'm not sure if she's joined yet, have Kim Moore Bailey from Youth Outside. We have Vince Sales from Everyday Impact Consulting. We have Elion Stefanik from Conservation Lands Foundation. And we have Olivia Van Dam from City Surf Project. Um, so is Kim here yet? I'll invite um, each panelist to share a little bit about themselves, one or two minutes. And if Kim hasn't joined us yet, we can start with Vince Sales. Hello, uh, thank you for the invitation to join the webinar today. My name is Vince Salas. I'm a consultant with Everyday Impact Consulting. I've worked in higher education and in the nonprofit sector for about 26 years. I serve on, uh, I, and I have served on uh, area nonprofits here in Sacramento where I currently reside, as well as nonprofits in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you for the invitation. All right, thank you, Vince. Um, Elion Stefanik, do you want to add your Sure. Time? Yeah, hi there. I'm Elion Stefanik. I'm the California Program Director at Conservation Lands Foundation. Um, and at CLF, we work to protect, restore, and expand a suite of public lands called the uh, National Conservation Lands that are managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And we do that by partnering and uh, working with community-based organizations. So we um, invest essentially in, in grassroots and community um, and local leadership to design and implement campaigns around public lands that are uh, that are reflective of the communities where we work and where we serve. Um, and prior to that, I worked in philanthropy. Um, I've worked also worked on community issues around restorative justice, where I had the opportunity to, to really bridge and and see the impact um, and the the mutual partnership between communities and uh, the environment. So I'm excited to talk to speak with you all today. Thanks for having me. 
Thanks so much. Um, Olivia Van Dam, you're up. Hi, um, I'm Olivia Van Dam. I'm the program director at City Surf Project here in San Francisco. Um, I've worked with Bay Area nonprofits um, in environmental education specifically for the past six years. And I'm pretty committed to increasing diversity and raising awareness around social justice and environmental justice in our communities um, at the leadership level and the board level and um, just being an advocate for uh, young people. I work with young people um, who are underrepresented in environmental education here in the city. And our mission, we just do, we do environmental education work um, through surfing. So I'm a surfer and a rock climber um, and know the power of connecting to the outdoors through recreation and how that leads to conservation. Um, and have more of an interest in talking about DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion in regards to access. Um, coastal access is something I work on a lot at the policy level and getting more representation for nonprofit groups like ours, um, working with state parks and national parks um, in the area. Great, thank you so much. And Kim Moore Bailey from Youth Outside, can you please introduce yourself? I see you're there, Kim. Can you hear us? You don't seem to be muted. All right, well, hopefully Kim can get her um, audio working, but in the meantime, we can move on to the first question. Um, so the first question we have for today are what are some environmental fields that are traditionally occupied by communities of color and what makes those fields attractive to them? And if any of our panelists have anything to say on topic, feel free to, to jump in. Tim, is your sound working now? Can you tell me, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself really quick? Hi, everyone. So sorry. Of course, I was having computer issues. Uh, I'm Kim Moore Bailey with Youth Outside. Uh, thank you for allowing me to participate today. Awesome. Thanks, Kim. Would you uh, be able to maybe start us off with your thoughts on the first question? What are some environmental fields that traditionally occupied by communities of color and what makes these, field, um, these fields attractive to these communities? Um, well, actually, um, I don't actually understand this particular question. Um, I'm assuming that as we think about environmental fields, we're coming from a somewhat Western perspective or a Western framing as to what this means. I mean, if you think about communities of color, we've been engaged in environmental programming um, traditionally for forever. Um, but if we come, come at it from a Western framing, um, there have been communities of color who have been engaged in the, you know, let's say environmental field, quote unquote, um, again, for, for years. I mean, just this past year, the California Conservation Corps had an all Latina cohort. There's an outdoor educators of color that meets in San Francisco. Uh, I think it's every other month. Uh, many of us have been aware of PGM1, who's been meeting for the past three, past three years to sold out uh, programming. Um, and so there are not necessarily, in my opinion, environmental fields that are traditionally occupied by communities of color. I think communities of color traditionally occupy all environmental fields. Um, and so I don't necessarily see one over the other that emerges uh, as a space or a place that is more attractive to one community um, more than others. 
Awesome. And I guess in that same kind of realm, in those organizations that are doing a good job at engaging communities of color and have involvement, what are they doing or what is attractive about them? Um, maybe I can uh, participate and and offer my two cents on that question. So I think the, in, in can you hear me, first yeah. of all? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so I'd, I'd like to offer two areas where at least the Asian Pacific Islander community are very much engaged in, and the first, uh, the first area is community organizing. Um, we need to, in our community, there has to be a lot of emphasis on organizing our community and in its diversity. You know, the Asian Pacific Islander community is not a monolithic community. Uh, we, within the rubric of API, there are several uh, languages that are spoken, whether it's Chinese. Uh, Tagalog, Korean, Japanese, Khmer, um, Hmong. So we have to be really aware about that, the, the diversity of that community. And so community organizing is a tool that the community is using to mobilize all of these different groups towards one vision and one direction. Uh, the other area that uh, the community is very engaged in is um, civic engagement, you know, trying to get communities to um participate and actively engage in in um in civic activities and civic duties that then would hopefully um get them, more informed, get them more informed and educated about issues that are are directly impacting the community so in terms of the areas community organizing is one and civic, civic engagement is another all right thank you yeah, and, and I would add as well, I think that's a really good convince, um, but in my experience, you know, people work on issues that they care about, issues that are important to them, their families, and their communities, and um, it, and I think that's that's an important just thing to think about, because when we think about who is in a certain space, um, and if you look at historically, I think on conservation and public lands more recently, um, we look at who who are the people that are recognized in this space. They are not necessarily people of color, but as Kim said, those people have been there. And I think it's a matter of being intentional about who we celebrate and who we recognize, who are along those journeys, um, along with the other people who have been celebrated already. Yeah, and I can add to that too. When I when I first heard the question, um, the first thing that came to mind was like my own ancestors and my own family who um, are Mexican American or Mexican and came and worked. I think of my great grandpa who came and worked in the fields, and I consider that that job and that field as an environmental field of, um, you know, being um, a migrant worker, but being working outside, um, working in the fields working in um, picking and cultivating and land management. Um, I consider that part of the environmental field. So I think w back to um, also add to what Kim said, it's, it's true, we have to really reframe um, what we mean by the environmental field and that definition and what, what I'm assuming is also like that westernized approach, but um, my ancestors and, and um, Mexicans have been working the land and have a connection with the land and so do indigenous people and, and we always have been environmentalists um, and I think that people of color and communities of color have always been connected to the environment um, and ha we have a lot to learn from as like a western society from indigenous perspectives and other indigenous knowledge of what it means to be in relationship with the environment. Thank you. Any final thoughts on this question? Okay. Question two, what are opportunities to increase diversity, equity, and inclusivity in environmental fields? Um, let me take that question on just to kind of um, stimulate conversation and discussion. So I think it's really important, at least for the API community, to have trusted messengers 
folks who are um, looked upon by their community as someone they can trust, who are culturally fluent and linguistically fluent um, as well. So in, in a lot of cases, these individuals are are the facilitators of conversation between community and the larger kind of mainstream society or community. And they're looked upon as, as people who can broker uh, relationships and also advance the interests of the community. So having trusted advisors is really important to increase diversity and equity and inclusivity in environmental fields. You know, that's really important for our community. Yeah, that's that's a really good one. Um, I was going to add or say and to that at the grassroots level, um, if if you're an environment for environmental organizations or anyone really doing programming, um, I guess my advice would be to reach out to your communities and ask ask yourself, are you truly ser serving everyone in your community? Um, who is missing? And then um, reach out using those those messengers that Vince mentioned, and meet people where they are, rather than trying to bring people to you and to what your programming is. To really start a conversation about um, how you can benefit one another, and how um, the community can benefit from the work, and the community yeah. being, you know, that that inclusive uh, look at at who you're serving and how. The entire community can benefit from programming or your organization or your your um, intent um, and then the other point uh, which is similar to what I raised in the in the last question is about elevating and celebrating the leaders and the people that are already that may already be doing that work or similar work um, there are a lot of great people doing work out there and I think with the, the power of social media now uh, there are many opportunities for us to celebrate what's happening out in the world uh, by better connecting ourselves with people of color and with people who are um, looking at conservation and environmental work from these uh, sort of non-Western perspectives. Um, yeah, some, Do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, sure. Um, something else, like another way that we can, um, an opportunity, I guess, is to um, fund these spaces, like uh, affinity spaces. So affinity space is basically um, a place where people who have the same identity, like people of color, um, can meet and join together and have these um, brave spaces where they can uh, learn from each other, heal, um, talk about issues uh, that they want to do, and then also work through the different types and levels of privilege that exist in people of color. I think we need to think about um, colorism and racism and privilege within people of color instead of grouping all people of color. Um, as Vince was saying earlier, within the API community, there's a lot of differences and a lot of different identities within just what it means to be a person of color. And so it's really important if you're an employer, um, if you have staff that identify as people of color, to give them space and to let them hold space for themselves. Um, and that's kind of what the PGM1 conference has been. It's a, a place for people to um, meet one another and work towards goals and heal from um, things that they've gone through within the environmental field and to learn from each other as well and get tools. So funding um, PGM1 or supporting groups like Affinity Spaces. Um, Kim mentioned one that I'm a part of in the Bay Area called EEOC or Environmental Educators of Color. Um, I think that's an important step and I know that some nonprofits in this field are doing a good job of um, creating those spaces and allowing their um, employees to to talk and organize and be amongst one another um, as people of color and then also exploring and getting out of that putting all of us in one box I think that's something that I've been hearing lately that we need to work on is um, all people of color 
aren't the same and some of us um, who have more privilege than others even within being a person of color. Hard to come after Olivia, um, but I, I guess I, the only thing that I would add is, you know, is to sort of flip the question and sort of say, you know, what, what aren't the opportunities? Um, you know, it's, it's not about what, what, it, what are the opportunities. It's, I think the question is, why aren't we doing it? You know, what, what are the barriers? Um, there's, there's an abundance of opportunities um, before us, and I think the question is, what is keeping uh, if this is truly a goal of your organization, um, then what is the barrier that is keeping you from reaching that goal? Thank you. Um, we have a message from Estrella Reisinger. Um, as the ED of AEOE, I'm really interested in developing affinity spaces for environmental education, educators of color statewide. While I think we need to hold orgs accountable for fostering equity and inclusion, I also imagine it can be hard to create those spaces within smaller organizations. If there's anyone out there that would like to discuss ways to bring this to AEOE, please reach out. Thanks, Estrella. All right, question three. What actions can people in environmental organizations take to increase diversity and inclusivity? in all aspects of their organization, board, staff, community, and other stakeholders. So some of the, uh, this has been, and uh, some of the responses is kind of implied in that question where really needing to look at the diversity of the organization from board, um, from the board to make policy and um, um, decisions for the organization to staff who also uh, uh, think about pro uh, do program planning and implementation and evaluation. And um, it's important that uh, the communities are communities of color are represented in all aspects of the organization. Um, I think it's also important for organizations to to um, find find issues where they can collaborate with um, uh, with people of color, especially issues that are important for people of color communities. So, for example, um, I'm very familiar with this one organization called the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, and they they've done work in the Richmond, um, they've done work in Oakland Chinatown. So, you know, finding issues that are important to these communities and working in collaboration and um, in partnership. I think it's, it's important to increase the awareness of this, this issues in organizations and also to you know, leverage the networks that all of everyone has to make sure that we are having an impact on the communities uh, that are impacted, for example, by by Chevron in, in Richmond or whatever development and gentrification is happening in, in Oakland, Chinatown. Thanks, Vince. Sure. And, and I can add, it, it, it seems rather, uh, I guess obvious, but uh, my advice would be to make a plan, um, develop goals, engage all levels of the organization, um, and make sure that leadership is on board and engaged. Um, that way, that that way, there's you know vision coming from the top, um, and also vision coming from from the staff, um, and that way, all levels of the organization are engaged. And um, I guess I would also add that there are, uh, as we're seeing on, on this panel today, there are a lot of people out there that are working on, on these issues. And there are a lot of, there are many organizations and consultants who have done and are doing this work. Um, so if any folks are 
are interested in, in diving in, um, I think there's a community out there that will support you. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, just um, I think the first question really is if you're is your organization committed to this particular goal? Um, it, and I think if the, the answer is yes, then I think we have to stop leading with diversity as the beginning and the end game. Right. I think it's about starting with this idea of equity first uh, and really paying attention to your organization's culture. And what is it doing to support this idea of equity? Um, what's happening internally? Uh, and much like Vince uh, and Elaine said, I mean, it's, it's inclusive of community engagement. It's inclusive of thinking about a plan. It's, it's engagement from the top of the organization, um, from your org structure to uh, your, your seasonal and volunteer staff and making sure that it's a commitment throughout the organization and not just at a particular here of the organization and that you're holding folks accountable um, to this particular value within the organization. Um, it's looking at your policies and procedures. It's looking at your hiring practices. It's looking at how you tackle difficult conversations and what's tolerated within your organization. Um, it's, it's a lot of work <laughs> um, and it's not always an external activity and, and the diversity part, whatever that means or whatever that looks like, is not the beginning, it's really the end product. Um, it's the work within the organization that needs to happen in order to create a culture that's going to support whatever that outcome is that you're seeking. Um, because if you want to shift the culture of your organization in order to bring in those who have thus far not felt comfortable, who have not felt included, then there's work that needs to be done within the organization in order to, to open up that space um, to bring in those that have thus far not felt engaged. Um, so I would say that that's really the, the work that needs to be done needs to start internally. Um, and, and it's going to take some time. Uh, and as Elaine said, it's going to, it could take engaging others to support you is, is absolutely a good idea. Um, and it's going to take a commitment, um, a, a real commitment in order to begin to shift uh, in all aspects of your organization uh, to get to a goal that perhaps you're not quite there yet. Thanks, Kim. Olivia, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, can, can I just add yeah. some? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, so I think it also, it, it starts at the individual level as well. Like. <clears throat> I think leaders and all of us have a lot of work to do at the individual level and we can all do a better job at educating ourselves and checking our own um, kind of the way that we follow the status quo and the way that we think about um, what it means to be a leader, what it means to be um, engaging in this work and having our own kind of opinions on that or wherever that comes from, really like delving into our own individual level of um what these words mean for us and and then going to the organizational level and yes involving everyone i think um kim said it really great like you can't just go for diversity first um, it really needs to start with equity um, and inclusion and then the diversity will come later but i think it can be really dangerous um if you are just trying to do a check box mark uh, like check off the box and say we have diversity, we hired, you know, um, a certain amount of brown and black staff and look at our diversity. That's like a very dangerous route to take and you will you will end up doing more harm to those people um, because your organization wasn't actually prepared and you as an individual or you as an executive director or you even as another fellow staff member um, weren't prepared to actually hold space and actually welcome um, people with different backgrounds into your organization, even though you thought you were and you thought you're doing the right thing by bringing more diverse people in, that doesn't automatically make your organization um, a diverse place to work. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, Vince, did you have something you want to add? Yeah, just, yeah, I, I just want to add, thank you, Kim and Olivia, for your comments. I, the only thing that I'd like to add is, you know, I've seen 
for example, arts organizations that have a, a an equity statement as part of their, um, you know, not just a value that they place on diversity, but actual statement on behalf of the organization about what they're going to do around equity. So um, that might be something that um, organizations such as the Sierra Nevada Alliance can look into. Um, so type of starting off with an equity statement. Um, and I think that, you know, part of, um, part of really looking at um, inclusive, including um, inclusive um, ways to, inc to involve communities of color is, is really looking at how much uh, all the resources you're devoting to um, making sure that, that communities are included. So for example, um, I, I mentioned earlier the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, where in, in their, uh, as, the, as part of their response to what's going on in the Richmond community for low Asian refugees and immigrants is to translate some of the warning systems in that community when there's a fire that breaks out, um, that they are having um, warning systems in the different languages of the communities that reside in that community. So I think translating some of that equity uh, values and actual tactics and strategies that that respond to community needs is really important. I think one more thing to add is just transparency. I think being transparent and being authentic with where you are at in the process and not lying about that just to try to um, harness or gain more um, people that you want to be on your staff. Um, I think it is really important um, for people who are or interviewing or on the other side of the hiring process to really be transparent um, with where they're at in their process of um, DEI work. And if they, if they are making an actual statement about it or putting an equity statement um, or putting you know, diversity as one of their values, um, do your due diligence. And as someone who's looking for a job or someone who is actually hiring on, take that opportunity to show that you are willing to be transparent with that person on where you're at in this journey and where you're at in the work. Um, and I think another, a resource or a book that I'm reading right now that I think is really um, helpful in this process and rethinking about these types of conversations is Emergent Strategy by um, Adrienne Marie Brown. And I think she's really helped me kind of understand and start to tackle um, what it means to be uh, truly in community and in uh, reciprocity with other people. Thank you. Anything else before we move on to the fourth question? All right, so what are some of the unique assets that communities of color bring to this industry and how can we foster the cultivation of these assets? Any thoughts or reasons why this question isn't resonating? <laughs> I, I can start. It's not actually on our panel anymore. So, yeah, th this is Elia, and I can start. I would, I would say, just in relooking at this question um, and thinking about Vince's response to an earlier question about, um, you know, the communities of color. We are not monolithic yeah. uh, people, um, and if if, if an organization or if a program or if a person wants to be intentional about reaching out to someone or a subset of the community to, to be intentional about it and, and to, to reach out, um, you know, communities are diverse uh, regardless of the color of one's skin. Um, communities are diverse and when more people in the community are engaged, more perspectives are brought to the table and there becomes a broader understanding of, uh, for my, for my own work, how people enjoy the outdoors or how people um, enjoy the 
enjoy public lands and vice versa, how public lands may benefit communities. Um, and when there are more, when there are broader perspectives at the table making decisions, programming organizations, then decisions should be made around those benefits um, and those conversations. Um, so that, yeah, I guess I would note that to start the conversation. Well, let, let me just add that um, to that uh, these communities are, are vibrant communities. Um, you know, the API community, it's a vibrant community that's very diverse. It's been mentioned in the, in the previous um, points. And um, they're all, you know, we're very concerned about the environment in which we live. We, we want to be able to have safe, sustainable environments where we can live, work, and play, right? So I think that um, when, when there are certain forces that impact on, on the safety and the health of these environments, you know, um, we want to be able to react um, and, and also proactively um, make plans to ensure that we, we have these spaces in which we can live in sustainable ways. So um, I think it's just important to remember that um, we're always striving, you know, all of us are interconnected in, in one way or another, whether you're working in, in a situation of, uh, where, where you live in a city or you live in rural communities, we're, we're in, in one form or another, another we're, we're, we're interconnected and we are, uh, there are forces of, uh, gentrification that impacts us or forces that are mostly focused on profit orientation that impact us. So we have to also find ways to make these connections and, and find um, avenues by which we can have concerted efforts to fight uh, laws or bill, proposed laws or bills that impact all of us collectively. Um, because we want to make sure that we live at the end of the day um, in communities where we are safe, uh, vibrant, and, and healthy. Thank you. Any final thoughts before I open this up to questions from the audience? Yeah, I think I um, I echo what Elaine said in struggling with this question and sort of the A lumping of the communities of color or all people of color together. Um, B sort of highlighting the sort of unique asset um, line. I'm, I'm not really sure what that means. Um, and so I, I, I struggled when I saw this particular question and, and this idea of sort of fostering the cultivation of those assets. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I would say this. Um, when you think about communities of color, whatever that means to you, um, we don't have these conversations because we are connected to what whatever environmentalism means to us, right? We don't have to have the conversation around what does it mean? It means whatever it means to us. And we are in these spaces um, and we're doing the work. And what we have to figure out is, is, the, is the exclusion questions, right? Um, is the uh, exhaustion around having to work twice as hard to be accepted? Um, and I think what we know is when we have the conversation, the silos disappear. It isn't about a person of color and environmentalism, right? Uh, it isn't about uh, a one and uh, or one or, it is a one and. Um, and I think that is, is what, what our voice brings forward, right? We don't have to have the separation conversation 
about bringing diversity and equity and inclusion into the field. Um, we're doing that. Um, we're ready to move the conversation forward to much of what Vince was talking about around healthy communities um, and creating greater access um, and addressing environmental justice issues. Um, we're ready to have those conversations and not necessarily have it steeped in um, issues around race or ethnicity or socioeconomics. Thank you. Olivia, is your hand raised? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, what don't we bring to the table is kind of what I was thinking about. Um, and how just because of our identity, how does that make us different? Um, and that's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, and I think about like just years and years of lived experiences and in my workplace, how I've had to um, share some of my trauma and share some of like my lived experience to, in order to raise concerns about um, what other people in our community might be facing as well. And so I think what we have to offer is being um, a voice and using our voices and our power um, in order to really awaken and, and have people who don't identify as, as POC um, to rethink about their processes and to stop and slow down and um, really reevaluate what they're trying to do and what they're actually, um, what their motivations are. Um, I, yeah, this, this question is a little bit hard for me to answer as well, but um, I think like supporting people of color in your organization financially as well is like a huge uh, piece that I've been thinking about um, as far as, you know, making sure that they're not getting less than. Um, I think that happens a lot um, and maybe it's not, it's not as transparent or it's not, not everyone sees payroll, but the people at the top making decisions about um, how much people are getting paid, what benefits they're offered, um, and what types of leadership or decision-making power that they have um, needs to be thought about. And so thinking about the, them as, um, and just going back to the equity piece, like they're, you know, they even, it's seen in a lot of organizations, even people of color with um, similar experience, similar education background are still getting paid less and still getting um, less opportunity to be invited to decision-making um, conversations. And so cultivating them um, and um, appreciating them and valuing them at the same level um, or even more, I think sometimes in certain case scenarios, if, you're, if your target audience or your target program group um, are youth of color or are underrepresented people of color, um, that's who you're trying to serve then you should be probably paying more for the expertise of your staff on, on your team um, who are offering and who come from those communities because they have a way to connect with people um, in such a deeper, um, more intimate way of knowing and bringing that expertise to the table. Thank you. Um, all right, we can open it up to questions. Anyone, any participants have any questions for our panelists? And if you aren't on, um, if you don't have a way to speak, but you're on a computer, you can type it in and I will read it. That's sometimes the easiest way anyways. Um, I have a question and it's just, if your organization is starting this journey, making that commitment, where, 
where are the first things besides maybe like a diversity statement, but where are the other places I can go, resources that we can reach out to, to um, start making the changes? organizations that work on this who are who are the resources for organizations who want to make this commitment and make this change well um for uh, let me suggest that for you know one of the more prominent api uh, asian pacific islander organizations is asian pacific environmental network um so they're based in the Richmond area. And they, they do partner with different organizations, not only API organizations, but also communities of color organizations. Awesome, thanks, man. Has anyone on the panel heard of the Next Gen Climate America? No, I have not heard of that. Okay. No, and I and I'd say to the person who is looking to for their organization to start the work. Um, I mean, it's such a. a big question and I think the you know the where that you want to start I think is what is um, giving me pause as to you know like the how um, and I think that's really the um, that's that's the bigger question and so I would I would guess I would say it, tap into your network as to see if there's anybody else that has begun this journey uh, to see if you can find someone who is perhaps one or two steps ahead of you um, to see where, how they begun their journey. Was it a training that they were able to attend? Um, was it a book or a resource like Olivia mentioned that sort of sparked them on their journey? Um, what, what allowed them to sort of get the ball rolling, so to speak? To, so to speak? Um, and, and where did they start? How did they begin to unpack it? Was it something, uh, an HR issue that began the work and that's where they actually began to, to do the, that's where the conversation started. Was it a marketing issue? Was it a really recognizing the community that they were serving had really transitioned and they needed to think very differently about, um, you know, uh, their, their curriculum and their program design and the staffing that they were hiring. Like something is sparking you to make this a priority. Figure out what that is um, and then try and seek others who have started in a similar place to then begin to bring together the resources to allow you to do this in a successful way. Thank you. Um, Estrella wrote that in her experience at Nature Bridge, uh, they've only been able to make real progress when they brought our, their leadership into the conversation and actually committed dollars, staff time, consultants, etc. Yeah, I think that's really an important point and I was going to um, make note of that. But yeah, I think it, it needs to have the, the backing of the money and the time and the consultants and definitely having um, the efforts in that. And then, like I said before, it needs to start at an individual level of um, really doing research on your own and um, starting to dive into um, you know, the, the work that's out there. there. There are so many resources, and I think just a simple Google search, even within the environmental um, community, there's the Aparna group, there's Youth Outside, there's um, different nonprofit consultants, you know, that Elaine brought up earlier um, that are willing and um, ready to help. Um, and I think the question that Kim brought up is really important because um you need to know what's motivating you what's sparking you to actually make changes um and then uh 
to have a focus um, on what the goals are of this um, effort is really important too because I think I've been involved in an organization where um, unfortunately they they didn't have the right um, intentions from the start and I think you need to always remember that when you're talking about diversity and equity and inclusion it's about human beings and you're talking about people um, it's it's not like a strategy for you know um, and, and it needs to be enveloped into every single piece of your organization it can't just be only in programming um, it has to then kind of trickle down into your fundraising strategy into how you're um, interacting with donors how you're interacting with your volunteer base how you're treating your staff. And it, it can't just be an HR issue. It has to also be in every component of your, of your organization, which makes it that much more of a commitment. And that's why you have to really know why you want to do this and um, actually commit everything to it, which you know is daunting, but I think it's extremely important um, because like I said, we're talking about people and we're talking about um, just a, creating stronger communities um, that are working together in a, in a more healthy way. And um, those efforts need to be authentic. And so um, one experience I have that I'm willing to share is that um, I've been part of an organization that um, was trying to just meet a quota of, we need to hire X amount of um, people of color so that we can get a certain grant so that we qualify and have a certain amount of people of color on our staff. Um, therefore, we can actually get this funding. Um, and I think that's a very negative reasoning behind why you would wanna bring people of color onto your team. Um, and it's extremely damaging and um, can backlash really, really bad. And it should, as it should. Um, so really think about, okay, why, why are we doing this work? Um, and why do we want to um, work towards that? Because it can be a really negative uh, reason and I encourage people to, to not do that. Thanks, Olivia. Any final thoughts? I have a question. Um, hopefully this isn't too specific, but we are, um, the organization I work for is a uh, land use advocacy organization and we're currently going through uh, a big land use planning process in our town. And we don't think the town is doing a very good job of reaching out to a number of communities that have historically been excluded from the land use process. And so we have got some funding and want to do some community outreach to these communities who have not um, who have historically been excluded from the conversation through language barriers and meeting times and all of that. And it, we are partnering with, um, some, with organizations that are already working in those communities. But do you have any other tips for, for reaching out when we don't think the town is doing a good enough job? We have the expertise in how to participate in this public process, but we haven't had a ton. Our organization hasn't done a ton with some of these other communities before. Hopefully that's not too specific. It's a pretty specific question, but. <laughs> Any thoughts for Lynn? And sorry, Lynn, I, I caught what you, the framing of the question, but what was your specific question? Um, other than working with organizations that are already in the communities, is, do you have any other tips for like outreach or, um, you know, this is kind of our first big step into um, into doing these kind of educational programs in for people other than who are our, like our donors. You know, we're we're expanding our education and outreach programs, and specifically hoping to to work with some of these uh, communities that have been historically left out of the process. Mm -hmm. And we just don't have very good contacts, or we don't have that. We don't really have a trust 
relationship built yet. And that's what we really want to do is like, because specifically they've been, um, uh, specifically the Spanish speaking community has been invited to meetings and then not had a Spanish interpreter for the town. And we, you know, we want to, we want to build trust so we can help, um, help everyone participate in this public process. Mm -hmm. So I guess like trust building mm -hmm. tips or. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you, uh, your, your gut is kind of telling you there that the, the language barrier is one barrier to address. Um, I think it, looking at your materials as you begin to engage the Spanish speaking community, are they in Spanish and English? And then if you're asking folks to show up to a meeting, um, is there somebody, will the programming be held in Spanish, in Spanish and English? Um, is there somebody who can translate? Um, and, and then in addition, um, you know, what time are the meetings? Are they being held in the middle of the day when most people are at work? Or are they being held in the evenings where childcare might be an issue? So you might also you know, wanna consider providing childcare or a stipend um, uh, for food or meals so that those people who are taking time out of their precious days, time to, to be at that meeting. Um, those are some ideas at the top of my head. Another, another thought is to think about where, where else um, communities gather. Um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at tabling, perhaps maybe the library, um, um, other markets or grocery stores, um, you know, rather than sort of your, your maybe beyond where you may typically um, table. So if you yeah. ask them, go out to where those people are um, and, and provide them with uh, opportunities to engage that is uh, inclusive of their language, um, that might be an initial step. Great. Yeah, that's a that's a big goal that we're trying to raise funds for now is to be able to do them and uh, to have a Spanish facilitator at at our meetings. And, and uh, just to add to that, and those are all great points. I think I don't know if you mentioned um, partnering with a community based organization that that is looked upon by the community as a source of credible information that they can trust that this is not um, a government ploy to like uh, corral people mm. that it's really a, a place where people can you know um, have a discussion about issues that are impacting their community in language and in context that's familiar to them mm -hmm. and so having a community organization that may be, you know, not necessarily providing um, environmental uh, services or issues, but it could be a community center or it could be a health organization that yeah. you partner with, that you really partner in the truest sense of that, where um, you're uh, not just kind of like going in there and then leaving after you get all the information that you need, right? That uh, in lockstep throughout the process, um, even to the point where you're, um, you know, implementation and also um, delivering the um, the program that you're really in close partnership with the community-based organization that that is uh, trusted by by that that but by that community. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers, Olivia, Elian, um, Vince, and Kim for joining us and sharing with us today. I'll be sending out um, a recording of this along, actually, that's all I've really got for this. So I'll be sending that out to all of you in the next day or so. Um, and if anybody wants to if any of our speakers feel comfortable sharing like your contact information with um, those who attended today, feel free to email me with that information. Otherwise, I will um, just be sharing this uh, recording of this webinar. So thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.